for having me. I think it's the best cookies I ever had in my life. And Nicole is just going to help me out a little bit with this one. So today it's the pursuit of happiness. And uh, the, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories because they dragged me all the way up from Galway. So don't let that mad sheep after me. I'll break them up into two. <laughs> this first story now is uh, when I think of happiness in my life, I think of this day. So I'm going to tell you about this day. Speed dating, says I. You're going speed dating. Young Michael O'Reilly was after plonking himself down next to me in the pub. He was dressed to the nines. Black jacket, black trousers, yellow shirt. Looked a bit like a wasp. <laughs> and the smell of him, it was like he was after dousing himself with the whole tin and laid air fresh now. <laughs> Yes, speed dating, says he. Uh, have you any advice for me, Nelly? Well, stop your laughing, says I. Was neither today nor yesterday that I was a girl courting, but I have me stories. It was three o'clock exactly. There was a knock on the door. I waited and I count to ten, because that's what you're supposed to do in them days, to as not to appear too eager. <laughs> I fixed me hair and I opened the door. And there he was, Eddie Murphy, standing with a big bunch of yellow daffodils and in the middle was a single blue agapanthus. Where'd you rob them, says I laughing. Oh, I didn't rob them, says he, all offended like, and he pulls a bit of crumply paper out of his pocket and twine as proof. Them yellow ones is daffodils, and uh, the blue one in the middle is, uh, uh, what is it? An angry pansy. <laughs> I got it because it matches the colour of your eyes. Jesus. <laughs> It was a great old day for the colour blue. I got a good look at him standing there in the doorway with the sun streaming in behind him. He had a big thick mop of black curly hair, a bit like Tom Jones. Now, I'd say if you put a comb near that hair, the comb would never come out alive. He probably just gave it a little bit of a ruffle and called it a day. He had a powder blue suit on, the kind you wear to a wedding in America. <laughs> and the shoes, mother of God, them shoes were gleaming. It was as if he was after sitting up all night with a gob full of spit and a rag in each hand, polishing, polishing, polishing. It was either that or he paid off the fairies to do it. Anyway, we put the flowers inside and we got the bus off to Bray, the seaside. <coughs> oh, it was a gorgeous day. Blue skies and the sun was streaming. Seagulls were swooping down and all them little shops were filled with plastic buckets and spades and big coloured balls and candy floss. You could taste the salt in the sea air quick enough to bring out the hunger in you. He took me off down to Singleton's Tea House, very posh. Now we ordered a pot of tea and a plate of ham sandwiches. Now the sandwiches were lovely, don't get me wrong, but they were very dear on account of they cut them into quarters and then they cut the crusts off them. I thought was very daft. Why would you pay more for less of a sandwich? <laughs> the least they could have done was put it in a little bag and give it to you when you're leaving so you could fry it up with a bit of butter after the pub. <laughs> or feed it to the ducks in the green. Anyway, we polished up every last crumb on the plate and we headed down to have our fortunes told by the women and the prom. Now, in them days, fellas wouldn't be seen dead as a fortune teller. Oh no, it was far too womeny for them. They'd stand outside and they'd smoke a fag. But oh no, Eddie Murphy wanted to come in with me. It was Madame Lee's in the back room. We passed through purply lacy curtains with jingly bells. And there was a great smell of incense and bacon on the boil. <laughs> we pulled back that last curtain and there she was a 
young one about nine with a scarf tied in her head. <laughs> Me auntie's on her tea break, says she. I'm only learning, but I'll do yous for half price if yous don't want to wait. Half price? Sure, that was brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, look at that bargain crystal ball didn't tell me yet that I wasn't going to know already. I was going to marry a tall, dark, handsome man and I was going to come into money unexpectedly. <laughs> but wait till I tell you. Weren't we only out the door when doesn't Eddie spot a shiny new shilling on the ground? He picked it up and he pressed it into me hand. There you are now, says he. That's half it come through already. <laughs> I was scarlet. <laughs> Red as a beast, Ruth. We might try a bit of dancing next week. I do love dancing, do you? I was too busy thinking of them two words to answer them. Next week. Anyway, we finished off our walk with two huge ice creams from the Italian and we got the bus back into town. Didn't he reach over on the bus and he grabbed me sticky ice cream hand. And you know, I might as well have been in a stretch limo. <sighs> back in town and the stars were twinkling and the moon was out and we headed off to Conway's pub. We got the corner snug and I barely the coat off me when doesn't he lean in and kiss me. <gasps> <laughs> He smelled like ice cream and pipe tobacco and, and something else, something kind of fruity. I found out later that it was a pear in his pocket. Yeah, a pear. Wait till I tell you, what happened is this feckin' agent of a cousin of his in England was after reading an article in the Reader's Digest, How to Get Your Girl, Supposedly, women are supposed to love the smell of apples. It reminds them of the harvest and having babies and all that. <laughs> and how's your father? <laughs> so if you want to get lucky with the girl, you put a bit of pear or apple peeling in your pocket and you'll get lucky. Poor Eddie was all of a tizzy. Didn't he grab a, a pear instead of an apple coming out to get me? Spent the whole night with squishy bits dropping down the inside of his trousers. Or could have been worse, could have been a banana. <laughs> oh, but the kiss. Oh, that kiss. Just at the end of it, doesn't he reach his two hands up to me face, like the priest with the chalice. <laughs> and the two eyes were bulging out of him like a fish. <laughs> What's wrong, says I, thinking I'd something coming out of me nose or something. <laughs> You're shining like the moon, says he. What, says I, you looked already and not even a sup gotten out of your point. No, says he, that's not me meaning. And he gets this look all serious like. You're glowing, Nelly. You're the moon and I'm the tide. And you draw me into you something awful. <laughs> that was the maddest way of talking I'd ever heard. It was like he was after swallowing a, a book of poems or something and he had the gas. <laughs> but I liked it. I loved it. And I didn't want him to stop. You have a fierce old pull to you, Nelly Kelly, to see. And I'll be shipwrecked before the day is out. And he leaned in and he kissed me again. And you know, for a few more minutes, I really did believe I was that old moon, never happier to be up in the sky, glowing and shining. We married in 63, and that's when I became Mrs. Nelly Murphy. Now, I lost him in 77, and it'd be 35 years this November. So, I have a little poem that I wrote from. I give it to you now. My husband, Eddie, had the shiniest shoes in Dublin. They tippy-toe on dance floors like shimmery drops of water. And when he passed, it was a flat grey lake of a day. No rhythm, none at all. But still, in dreams, he comes and takes me hand. 
him the tide and me the moon. And we waltz two, three, waltz two, three, waltz. Now, have I any advice for you, says I to young Michael O'Reilly beside me? I have. To win the heart of the girl with the bluest eyes in Dublin, ruffle up that hair. But if it's a pear peeling in your pockets, <laughs> and polish them shoes like there's no tomorrow. God bless. <laughs> and then I'll tell you another one. So give a big hand for Nicole Blue. So some people think this is a sad song, and there are sad bits. But when I wrote it, it made me so very happy. And uh, the song is about some time spent with someone who made me very happy. It's called Curvature of Venus. Can you see the curvature of Venus? She's looking like a mini. She's swinging from above like she can see us As we've gone too far with way too much too soon Remember when we said we'd go to Mexico So very fast in your car. I wonder if you ever thought we'd really go. Now I'm far away from where you are.
She's looking like a maniac And she's swinging from above like she can see us But we've gone too far with way too much too soon an easier road than for others. And I have a story I'd like to tell you about maybe a road that was a, a bit harder. Anyway. So do you ever look up at all the stars? Each one has a different story or a million stories. Stars in your eyes. Seeing stars. The Star Spangled Banner. The Star and Garter. Supernova. Super split, splitting hairs, hairs and graces, amazing grace, amazing. A burst of constellations, the bull, the bear, the big dipper, the Milky Way, the deep fried Mars bar. <laughs> Sheila Lally was a lovely woman. She was a dot. She'd do anything for you. Always a smile on her face. But one grey day, Johnny Flanagan asked her to marry him. I know, he was handsome and all, I suppose. But he was too fond of the horses, if you get my meaning. <laughs> He'd a little house on Barra Street with a leaky roof. There was nearly a babby. But it was a false alarm, it doesn't stick. But she was after marrying him anyway. So back to the house on Barrow Street they went, where the slates were slowly lifting. Sheila Flanagan was a lovely woman, always a smile and a handshake for the neighbours as they passed by the house. Now she didn't go out much because Johnny was blowing it all on the second horses. Well, she didn't mind too much. She always wanted to look nice for him. She had the loveliest long dark hair. So she'd wash it in the evening and she'd sit by the window with the blow dryer, blow dryer, and looking out for Johnny to come home. Well, one day, Johnny lost a package at Fairy House. The pawn shop was on the corner. He needed more pennies for the ponies. So out went the hairdryer, and that was that. Drip. Sheila looked up and saw where the rain was just starting to creep in from the slates from the roof onto her head. She thought it better that she cut her lovely long hair, easier to manage. Snip. Sheila Flanagan was a lovely woman. Always a smile and a wave for the neighbours as they passed by the house. Johnny didn't go out much with her. Of course, he had all the money. But she didn't mind too much because she was very fond of the telly. She loved Gabo. She did. She'd sit in on a Saturday night over in the corner watching the Late Late Show. Ah, Gabo's lovely, chatting away. Makes me forget about the day. Makes me think I'm far away. Oh, I do love me telly. But that day, you know what I'm going to say. Johnny lost another bunch of money at the horses in Cheltenham. I needed more money from the pawn shop. Something had to go. So out went the telly. And that was that. Drip, drip, drip. Sheila looked up at where that hole in the roof was now after inviting the rain in for a good old gawk. <laughs> she could feel the damp seeking into her bones. 
but Sheila Flanagan was a lovely woman. Always a smile and a nod for the neighbours as they passed by on their way to bingo. Now Mrs O'Toole noticed this and that, that day she won a deep fat fire in the bingo and she knocked into Sheila on the way home. There you are now Sheila, she she, that's for you. Sure I'm after winning three of them already. <laughs> Sheila lit up like a lighthouse. A deep fat fryer for me. <gasps> she was delighted. And that Thursday she set about making chips for Johnny's dinner. She was singing away to herself. Chopping potato chips, chopping potato chips, chopping potato, chopping potato, chopping potato chips. But she made too many of them. In all different shapes and sizes. What am I going to do with all these, she thought. So she wrapped them up in a little cone in newspaper, went out onto Barrow Street and started to pass them out to the children there. Oh, she had a big smile on her face. All them little chiselers were wolfing it down like greasy little goblies. <sighs> they loved it so much that they asked her to do it again next week and so on and so on until every Thursday there was a queue of children down Barrow Street shouting out for Sheila's Chips! Sheila's Chips! <laughs> Yum! <laughs> until one Thursday this little fat fella in shorts comes running up the hill, puffing away. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Johnny's after losing an awful lot of money. He's in an awful mood now. He's pawning at and he can get his hands on. Your deep fat fryer's gone for sure. Oh, Sheila's heart sunk. She went inside and she picked up her deep fat fryer and she looked up Drip, drip, drip at that hole that was now the size of China itself. <laughs> and that's when she thought to herself, not this time. She put the deep fat fryer down, she grabbed her coat, she ran out the door as fast as she could down the road. First stop, she went into Kelly's chemist. She got her prescription and she kept on running down the road, down the road. And then she gets into the Vincent de Paul. Oh, Hampton, oh, God love her. Give us a tenner's worth of your best second-hand bras, says she to the woman. A tenner, says the woman. Yeah, a tenner with the best elastic and make them snappy. <laughs> and out the door she goes and up the road again with the bundle under her arm and into the kitchen and she sat down. And she began to weave them bras together. And as she tied the knots tighter, she thought of all the women with holes in their roof and holes in their floorboards and holes in their hearts. And she tied them knots tighter. All these strange little bits of words were swimming around in her head like, like arses and nursery rhymes trying to find the fronts of nursery rhymes. <laughs> Weaving away she was. Nothing will stop me or get in me way or make me feel stupid and tell me I can't stay or steal all me sparkle and only bring rain. Nothing will stop me ever again. And she finished nothing up. What did she do? She got one end of them and she tied it to the leg of the big old cougar. The only feckin' thing Johnny hadn't pawned. And she got the other end and she put it around behind her back like this. And this end she tied to the leg of the banister. And she tested that elastic just to see. Right? She looked up at the hole in the roof where the rain was pouring in. But she looked up past that to the clouds and beyond the clouds and she could see stars. Stars were twinkling. So she took her medicine, she tucked her deep fat fryer under her arm and slowly back she leaned. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Up, up, out and away she went, away from Johnny, 
away from the pawn shop, away from that big hole in the roof, out past the clouds and into the twinkling stars where she could sing and no one would say boo to her and she could fly away to her heart's content. <laughs> She knew a comet passed the <laughs> <laughs> We're going to sing a far now. In space there's a spaceship chip shop. In spaceship shape chips. In space there's a spaceship chip shop. It's a spaceship shape chips. But our burgers large and small, sausages and chips for all. Supernovas are the walls on me spaceship chip shop. Lift them up in the air, lift them up proud. You won't regret the all night trip when you taste her tasty chips. A piece of heaven on your lips in the spaceship chip shop. So come on over, it's all right. Just look for the neon light. She's open all the day and night in the spaceship chip shop. Everybody sing along. In space, there's a spaceship chip shop. They sell spaceship shape chips. In space, there's a spaceship chip shop. They sell spaceship shape chips. One more time. In space, there's a spaceship chip shop. Send spaceship shape chips. In space, there's a spaceship chip shop that sells spaceship shape chips.